Okay, so welcome back to our last day lecture in Hacker Tools class. Today we're going to be covering some more like cool high level topics. The first one is going to be web and browsers, kind of how to also like all the capabilities that like, your web browser has, maybe in our most familiar ways. And then John is going to be talking about some stuff about like security and privacy. Um, so the main idea of this class, I'm going to be about this lecture more. Uh, I'm going to be a bunch of different stuff, so if at any point you have like doubts of anything that I'm covering, please let me know. You can also like slow down. Like, I'm going to be kind of jumping from one topic to the other because this is like a lot of miscellaneous stuff and like I think other topics like editors are like more structured. I think here we're going to just cover stuff that you might benefit like using and you're with it. And you're with it. I don't know how to increase the size of that, but I think with the browser should be. Um, first thing I want to cover with web browsers, maybe it's slightly stupid, but like I've been surprised by the amount of people that are not aware of this. As with any tool that like you've been using a long time, it's really worth knowing all the like common circuits. Like if you are kind of going and clicking for getting a new tab, that's probably like so often. Like, very easy ways. For example, like control or command T will create a new one. If you go somewhere and you close that and you want to reopen that common safety with that will do that for you there are some other convenient ones like if you want to open a new tab without having to go like right click opening a new tab um, you can do either with the middle mouse button if you're using like a mouse or you're with like common click um, another handy one is control l we can of or command l kind of place and focus the, the search bar so you can like automatically type here anything that you want and finally a pretty common one but like again like being surprised like one of times someone was not aware of, of that if you use com control f command f you will be able to like search quickly uh, within the within the <coughs> website also if you're like doing searches a lot of times so there are like some handy extensions that allow you to do regular expression searches within a website. So if you're kind of searching some website that has like a lot of data, instead of downloading, you may be able to just like do this right on the website itself. Uh, just two other things that are handy. Uh, control or command W will close the current tab. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so if you don't want to just keep accumulating them. Um, also, if you middle click a tab, it will close that tab. Oh yeah, true. And the next thing is search operators. When you're kind of using pretty much any modern uh, search engine, I think Google is what most people do, but like that, like, oh, I believe also supports most of us. I'm not so familiar with Bing or the other options. Um, I think like, I have like, some examples. Uh, I'm going to go one by one. They're like mm, web pages, and I have linked to one that have like, mm, pretty much a more true description. I think it's uh, worth knowing some of them. For example, if you want to have a, a, a exact match, I mean, this is like if, if say I want to search for this spray, but I, I want to make sure that this entire expression appears together. Like by default, Google, or like all these words, search engines, will search for matches where like kind of all these words are there somewhere, maybe not in order, maybe not like one after the other, but you can enforce kind of that all these things be treated as a, like a single unit, and then when you search, and my wife is going extremely slow right now, you can see that like this entire phrase is being matched exactly, and then it's kind of having the, the other parts somewhere else. Uh, another cool trick, you can say maybe you want to uh, search within some website, so you can say, oh, like site, I want this, the site to be searching to be Stack Overflow. So you can tell Google only to search within that. And you can see that like all the, you know, all the mm, web pages that it's returning are like within this domain. And it can be really useful because sometimes like web pages are indexed by Google, but they, are, they don't provide, maybe they provide like a search engine, but maybe it's not that good. Like I think I have an example that I, Come across really often is Reddit. Reddit has some search engine, but it doesn't work as well as just like searching on Google and then specifying that the site will be Reddit.com. 
Uh, another one, sometimes you want to kind of have like a negative math, like for example, I want to search for something that is in Cambridge, but there's two Cambridges, and maybe I don't want the ones that are in the UK. So by doing that, like no matter what you do, if the kind of the math has like UK somewhere, like Google or the search engine will try to like down the Moldar and have like the other results uh, pop up. So sometimes when you're getting like results and you kind of know that you don't want those results, you can use kind of the negative to avoid those. Uh, uh, another full one is you can do <laughs> the same as uh, with regex. You can say, oh, like maths, either or electronics or circuits, like nodes. And by doing that, like you can, like the like the, the engine will be matching like one or the other, and you can search. Another thing that you can do is uh, you can also specify instead of web pages because for example here is returning both like web pages and also like files say that i only care about getting like pdf files because like what i'm searching on like electronic or sequence notes maybe again I, I i want to get like more specific you can just say like oh the file type of the thing i want to be returning is pdf and uh, lo and behold all the res results that we are getting are pdf um, um, and there are many, many more. Again, like the link here, like you can specify all. Like there are like more uh, that you can use. I think like the ones that I have covered are like the most I, the, the ones um, I use most of the time. It's also like the wildcard, you can have like some wildcards so something can be matched even if you don't get like the specificity of getting one after the other. And next thing I want to cover is the search bar. So for example, like extremely useful tool, and I think like one really common uh, thing that many people do is you, oh, yeah, I want to go, I want to search something on YouTube. So like fairly common thing, like I want to search something on Wikipedia, something like that. And what you do is you search for Wikipedia, or like you type Wikipedia, you go there, and then you go and search within Wikipedia. Thing is, most modern web browsers, at least on our like both Chrome and Firefox, are aware of kind of like different search engines, and will allow you to like search directly within those search engines. So, for example, what I have set up right now is that if I do like why this way, like something like this, it will search directly into YouTube. I don't have to go to YouTube; it's searching directly there. And the way to set that up is different for different web browsers. But the main idea is that the web browser will be indexing all these different engines. And here you can say, oh, like for Amazon, I want that like if I type if I type AC before, I want to be searching on Amazon. And now if I go and type AC, I don't know, uh, eco, it will go and search directly in, in Amazon without having to go Amazon and then search. And that can be really fancy if so you're like searching uh, in the kind of similar web pages uh, often. Uh, another thing that's kind of related to kind of being efficient in the in the search uh, bar, one thing that I have used and is really handy. The only thing it has like a requirement you have to have like a domain like associated to your own. But like since it's fairly easy to just like type here, one thing that I do are like subdomain redirects. So what is happening here? Not if you can see it. I'm typing. Uh, that's like if you like I'm typing that and not like my domain like my, my like if you go to www that you will be going to my website. However, you type that into the web browser is redirecting directly to the class page, and that's really handy because especially how like some MIT class has like this really obscure and long um, uh, URL. You can just configure like all these subdomains. It's really handy because then I just type like HT and like it like, auto completes and it's really handy to jump to some specific web pages. And also, the, and like like the like in regular bookmarks, this will work in any device, not even in your own devices. Like you can tell someone else to just type that and it will work directly. The only thing is you will need like a domain to kind of be able to establish that. Um, any questions so far? Okay. Uh, next thing I'm gonna cover are kind of 
the privacy, like privacy you know, like useful extensions to have. There are like many, many like different extensions that like you can install on a web browser. I think one of like three good default like um, extensions that are installed in pretty much all the machines or like browsers that I configure is A, an ad blocker. I think like my, my, my choice is you lock her in. Other people use different ones that I have I have found this one to work uh, pretty well for like what I need. Mean. Uh, you have them, you know, like Chrome, Firefox. I think ad blockers are nice not only because like they're blocking ads. It's also because a lot of the time the kind of the the ad blocker is working by having some blacklist, like a series of blacklists. In fact, there is or filters that they call it like they go through to check when like the web browser is requesting like pages from different sites, and it's also really good as a mean of like malware prevention. Like most of the time, a lot of like malware sites have already been included in in ad blocking sites. I think it's a fair choice to even if you care about like supporting some website with like the ad revenue, it's a fair policy to have like this on by default and disable it in a specific cases. Like, like here for example, I don't know why I'm looking something, I can go and like disable. And like this will remember that I want to be like the ad blocker disabled in this specific page. Another thing is you can not only like install it and like leave it on by default. It's really cool that like you can go to the to the where is it where was this to the like the settings and like you can see all the filter clips that it has and, like I have enabled like a bunch of them. It's also like has different uh, filters for different regions. You don't want all of them on by default because every time you're making a request to a URL, it has to kind of go through a match. But like if you are in a specific place, you might be like I say like I want to enable the ones for when I'm in Spain visiting back home because those like the ad the the ad links there might be different. And that's also handy to use. You can also define your own. So for example, if you are in the website and we think this banner um, is a, an ad, you can by, by, like you can enable that that to disappear. Also, although I think that's easier to do with a tool I'm gonna be discussing later. Um, the next thing is not only there are like ads, they're just like showing you like some content that you may not care about. And also, if you have like some an ad blocker, sometimes depending on how blurry the page is, the load time will be reduced just because you're not making all these requests to to the website. Uh, the other thing is be aware about kind of trackers. And the the tool of choice, I think it's also recommended by Electronics like Country Foundation, is privacy bad. Like although a lot of companies that are not only using ads to kind of try to sell you stuff, it's also kind of to track what is your kind of digital fingerprint through the web. Like you are they are seeing like all these different places you're calling and maybe identifying you with the with some sort of like IP tracking or some some way, and again this extension yeah kind of prevents that from happening by just not making the request and just going in the middle. And if you go to some like popular websites as like New York Times, you can see that like both of them are like uh, getting a bunch of requests blocked because of these filters. Um, the last thing this is not really blocking much; it's just a good default and like. John will be explaining why HTTPS is better than HTTP when available and what this extension does, uh, which is called HTTP Everywhere, it just if there is a uh, secure version available, just redirects you to that one instead of going to the other right. one. I mean, uh, also fairly useful. Um, mm -hmm. Oh, and if you are into this kind of add-ons, I think there's like a section dedicated in this website that I'm linking, and you can get like more, like even harsher and harsher, of, like the automatically deleting cookies and like avoiding DNS tracking and even disabling JavaScript, which can be a same choice sometimes, although requires more effort on your side because you will really have to figure out when something is not working because you don't have like some part of the JavaScript enabled. But depending on the how panel you are, like how in control of these things you want to be. Here are like the choices that you can go through. Uh, I think that pretty much covers that part. Any questions or any of that?
the next thing is um, it's really good, uh, really easy to forget that when you're kind of using a web browser, like when you're using an editor or using the command line, you kind of feel in control of kind of everything that is going into a point. Like you can modify pretty much all the, how you're seeing. You have kind of how like the last say on how something is presented. You can kind of change the color scheme. You can change the font. You like you can edit a bunch of stuff. But when you're in the web browser, you're using just being presented with things, and you just take it as they are. But again, it's, it, the browser is just like a piece of software that is running on your computer. And again, you pretty much have the last say on how things will be displayed or how things will behave. So that's what I'm gonna get into now, which is kind of style customization, like performance customization in a way. Uh, first, I'm gonna briefly touch upon of like what is going on when you kind of get like a website. So when you can kind of get a website, you kind of don't only three things. You're downloading the uh, HTML, which is kind of just saying what are the things, like what are the, the contents of the website. And you can see here that like these different blocks correspond to like these different blocks of code that have like some data. And, like if you have like a really complex website that's the New York Times, this can get pretty insane. But like you have like your like our website, it's fairly simpler to see what is going on. And you can see that here, for example, we have the text, and it's pretty good. So the this is just detailing kind of the contents. Then you kind of have the uh, styles that are, are in the this, the different kind of the CSS, which is the code that is specifying. Oh, this will be this font, this size, with this amount of padding displayed here. And finally, when you have something. Uh, there is more interactive, you probably have like some sort of like JavaScript that is going to be running like um, running in this sandbox environment and you, you can do a lot of things and a lot of the time when you're seeing things like collapse or not totally collapse or making requests without reloading the, the, your page, all of that is pretty much happening with JavaScript. Uh, the first thing is, is kind of to be aware that like you can change the content of a website like I can go here and introduce like this is a post. And well, like I did that not what the server returned to me, but that's what I'm saying here. And this is one reason why you should never trust like any sort of screenshot that you get from like a website. Because it's not even, you don't even need Photoshop. Like it's extremely easy to tamper with the contents of like pretty much any website. And in the same way we have done that, we can go ahead and say, oh, I don't like this thing being uh, this color. I want the font to be red for some reason. And you can just go ahead and change that. And the thing is now, this is just gonna last temporarily. And whereas this is extremely useful when you're kind of debugging a website you know, in the sense of just kind of debugging the, uh, the, how this website is displayed and how these styles are compiled, this is not that useful if I always wanted the font to be red. If I wanted to, this to be permanent, this is not as useful. But still, we, we, can do, like we can just go ahead and install an extension called website which is called stylus and stylus will allow you to define the styles for different websites and you like kind of have like an override CSS after all the CSS has been applied. So as an example we can go to the website we have a very really, really kind of style but we can just say oh let's write a style for the website New window and we can say here we can see So here is like matching to this specific domain because we just told it to, we want to match to that domain. And then we can just start saying, oh, let's make a dark theme for the, the cloud web page, which is something that this is extremely useful for if you are into kind of dark themes. Uh, Ah, I have to check. 
So right now I just have uh, already like, and now if I reload this web page, this style is gonna keep being applied. And we can just go ahead and say, oh, I want the color to be light, and then I don't like this uh, font, I want this other font, and I want the font to be larger, and like you can just like keep going on and like modify pretty much any aspect of your, of the, how the, kind of the look and feel of the website. And here we go, have like a bunch of different stuff. Uh, and again, like now we, we reload the, the, our CSS is running on this, it's at the very end of the CSS, it's been applied last thing, and it will take control. Uh, also a really good thing is that there is this kind of uh, website called user style store, where like people like have already installed a bunch of different, uh, have, they have like listed a bunch of, um, uh, the different styles from different websites. So for example, uh, with, so that allows you to, if you, for example, go to Stack Overflow, uh, like, has like a very, and I didn't have to write this style. I kind of read through it to say that it wasn't like hiding anything important, but like, you can like say, find styles, and then like, oh, it will search that website about the repository of styles and look for the ones that will have like an, a string matching to the current domain or like the current rate spread. And same way, Git, they are like available for like GitHub, I think when I saw Amazon earlier, it was uh, not that common. Like a lot of them have already kind of been modified to, to work. Yeah, like it's also not that hard. I have written styles for, say, for example, the NumPy documentation or like the Python documentation. It's really, really easy to kind of get it working. Just kind of, you can see other people's styles, see what, what they're doing to, for example, get the syntax highlighting working. For example, if we go uh, to GitHub and we go to some repo, like the, let's say, let's say, maybe this stuff? Yeah, like for example, change is also kind of the syntax highlighting uh, along with everything. And it's also very interesting how CSS is, is working with this index highlight. Uh, so that's for style. You can also do kind of the same thing. You can pretty much do the same thing for behavior. Like you can also overload JavaScript, although it gets slightly more dangerous. Like in the sense, like you can do a lot of things with JavaScript, so you need to be extremely careful. Like the same way there's like a repository of styles and stuff like pretty harmless. Like running like some random JavaScript that someone has written on the internet can get extremely dangerous to quickly stick in your credit card details. So again, like never like import any script that anyone has like written and like without like reading it because it can be fairly dangerous. But let's say we want to kind of modify the behavior of the class website. So it has like a beam-like behavior. Like we want to enable like the JK uh, keys to go, to scroll up and scroll down. We can just write a simple user script that says, oh, like max the class website and all, all, all the sub pages of the website and run this really simple function that is just making, oh, if the J key is being pressed, then scroll down by a hundred, 500 pixels, and if the K is, um, if the K is key, uh, then just like go up, up, and like we can have like, there's also an extension, there are like several ones, and uh, the one I'm using here is called Tamper Monkey, and just go say like create new script, and we can just copy and paste this blob of code that we kind of understand everything that's going on here, Yes, save it. Delete the previous, delete the previous one because it was deleted. And now, if I go to the class website, uh, like I can use the J and K to navigate kind of up and down without using like the space bar. And like you can, you can use this in many, many, many different ways. Like you can like change how things are displayed. Like if like CSS is not good enough, you can 
kind of write scripts to kind of modify the content of a website or kind of click like some places on a website. But again, be careful exactly what you're doing or what, what code you're running. And again, like they have like repositories of people that already have like doing the scripts for common things that they do in nature. Any questions so far with everything so It's pretty cool actually. So I know you can do this in Firefox. I think you can also do it in Chrome. Uh, you can also write um, JavaScript for your browser UI. This is basically how oh, yeah. modern extensions are written. So you write JavaScript that modifies what happens in the UI of the browser itself. So for example, I've written different key bindings for my browser that run programs in the browser, such as reorganizing my tabs when I press certain keys. So you, that extension has access to all your tabs and can like shift them around, read their titles and whatnot. Similarly, in Firefox, or I don't think this is the case in, in Chrome, um, you can actually change, like the entire browser UI is styled using CSS. So you can write custom CSS for your browser UI. So I've done this to like move my tab bar to be an entirely different place in the UI. So these are the kind of things you can do when, once you start going down this route of like writing and injecting CSS and JavaScript. Um, the next thing I'm going to be touching upon, which is kind of slightly going from kind of exactly the browser to more of like the web. So it has, it has become like pretty easy, say, if I want to know my like some sort of, like, of information to just go on a website and check that out. However, if I want to do that as a part of like a cell command, like as a part of like a program, that becomes something tricky. Like you don't want to be kind of downloading the entire HTML, kind of parsing it. Like you can do it, and it's like the solution sometimes. But it has become more and more easy because there's a thing called a web API. So a web API is just like an application interface that you're using the web, and what you do is you make an HTTP request and you get something back. So for example, let's say I want to get a make an example of this. Probably we make things clear. I just make a request to this website and I get this back. This is a JSON object, which is just like a key value um, store. And can you make it larger? Oh, yes, sir. That's it, yeah. So, and what I'm getting is like, oh, like this website is seeing the request that I'm making and it's returning to me this blog of information that tells me what is my current IP, assigning it to Wi-Fi, like based on that, what city I'm based, and even like the kind of organization due to the IP range. And this can be extremely useful. This can be extremely useful for a variety of reasons. Um, one is like, say you want to like get the weather from somewhere. You can you can even get something that is really cool. Like you can get a, like let's see this block of code here. Uh, you can make a request to Google and specify some values and if we do that like we can get the auto completion that Google does based on those values so let's say I want to have a program that has the same auto completion as what Google will be giving to the users and I can just be a, I can, can do that by just making HTTP requests to Google so like I have to find the URL and now say, I'm saying, and I put in the request feed. And what I'm getting is also kind of um, there's an object thing is by default, this is kind of minified. So let's use the tool we saw in the data wrangling lecture and kind of to parse it better and even like some set to remove the, let's first try without the set, it's probably be easier. So if I do that, I'm, get, I'm getting Kind of the top recommendations that Google will give based on this Steve query, and it's also giving me like some HTML indicating kind of the emphasis. So, for example, here you have like Steve Universe and like the N is out because that's like the part that is kind of auto completing. Uh, but we can like just go and also remove that, and we can place that within like any bus script. Like, this is just like about like piping through a bunch of bad script, but the interesting part is we are like retrieving from like the from the web uh, this <coughs> information. You can oh I forgot to open the slug. What is this is a slug? Yes there we go. 
Uh, another thing is like these are not only good as a read-only mechanism. Like right now, there are like many, many modern uh, web services offer web APIs also for interaction purposes. So like I think pretty much, and I will get to the that in slightly later. But like for example, say you want to write like a bot that like goes and sends you something through Slack. You could write that by somehow hacking through the entire web browser and kind of clicking, but like, like the Slack offers you an API where just by making a simple uh, post request, you can just send a message. So for example, I have three authors here, and if I write this uh, request, and see that this request con contains the Slack token, that's because if I saw that there, you could be all of the tools like me here. So I'm just like have that as a variable. You can think of that as kind of the password, kind of the, the thing that you need to use to authenticate. And if I type that, uh, you can see immediately I'm getting like a notification and I just got like a message from this Slack bot. And again, it's just like basic like crawl post request. And if I uh, put anything here that is differently, you can say like, hello. Is appearing. And this is really nice because with really, really, really little uh, amount of code, you can get like a bunch of functionality with all these web services. And what is even cooler is that, like, since many, many of these web services already offer like this public API, there are like services like I, uh, if this, then that, that kind of have already done the piping for you and even provide kind of the server side. So maybe you don't have a server to be running all these uh, scripts all the time, they do that for you and they provide you like a bunch of uh, recipes, let's see. So they can get you like, oh, make, get me from like the weather underground, the weather and send me through a message. Or uh, every time I take a selfie, upload that automatically to Instagram or like every time I change my Facebook profile picture, also change my Twitter profile picture. Or you can even make a <coughs> you can even make a, someone's based on your location. For example, like, you, know, you can put like a geofence around your house and say, oh, every time I enter the geofence of my house, automatically send an API request to my smart light bulbs and turn them on automatically. So it can get really powerful. And like again, they offer you kind of some more high level programming of like yeah, like this value from this API and that action from that API, but sometimes it's extremely easy and extremely convenient because you don't have to go through and figure out the entire API. Uh, there's also Sapir, which is like more uh, extensive in some, some of the integrations that they support. But I think if this, if this and that has like pretty good coverage of most stuff. Um, that's pretty much for Wave APIs and things. So I have a question. Yeah. What does a command JQ does? Oh, yeah, yeah. JQ is, I think we covered it in the data wrangling. It's kind of like a <coughs> selector of JSON data. So if you're doing some okay. data wrangling with JSON data, I think like that's something you. Yeah. Uh, so what it does is just interpret some like select fields from like um, from a JSON file. So instead of trying to hack that with I don't know how do we even try to hack that with that, you can say oh select the second field and then from that select every other and then select that the, the ones that have this name and it's fairly convenient. Also there's like an equivalent I think for its HTML called Cook. That also does that way, and they all get me all the like blocks of HTML that are like paragraphs, which is like a P, or like get me all the divs that have like this class value. So, like you could be doing all of this maybe with regexes, but it's not worth. Like you have like if the language is already kind of established, is you probably have like some of these parsers, and it can get really easy to kind of parse them through and like get familiar with them instead of kind of writing. I don't know, Python script that could go and select the value that you want. Does that answer yeah, your sure. um, Kind of the last thing uh, I want to cover before the break is a uh, kind of like web automation. Is that like sometimes like web APIs are not good enough, and 
in that case you can in case you want to get information you can always do the thing where you can get the entire website or like, like just get the entire thing or like parse it and interact as whatever but if you want to be interacting with the website that can be extremely tricky especially because a lot of modern websites rely on significant amounts of javascript to run either kind of the asynchronous queries or things like that uh, in that case if you kind of want to try to simulate being a human either for unit testing purposes or just to kind of automate something that you know like if you find yourself using your browser you just find just find yourself just like clicking the same thing ten times or like clicking the same field and typing a thing and then another one and you find it's like oh this, like this is a computer I know how to program a computer why I'm doing something repetitive well there's kind of like a solution for that so um, I think pretty much uh, all of web browsers have like some interface right now to through web drivers and what web driver allows you to do is the same way like JavaScript kind of allows you to select things within the web browser you can just interact entirely to like instead of just a single web page to just to the entire web browser so you can say oh I want to go here find this element then click and then wait some time and then input this thing and then click again and automate this thing so for example this, this really simple example is just saying oh like get the Firefox driver get the web archive uh, website find find the element in that website that has that value well, like, let's go first to the um, let's go there first so we can like kind of see why are we searching that uh, for example if i wanted to go to this website like by default the like archive there are has like and I really really the API so like I can easily see if something has a written save but doesn't really allow me to save thing if I kind of want to save up for later and I will have to go here type a website and then enter wait and do that a hundred times if I have like a hundred websites that I want to save for some reason however you can just say oh let's let's see what is the value of the field here and you can say oh like the this thing has like the class and like web save URL input and I can just set oh, like web save URL input and then I can clear whatever there is like tell the browser to type the values into into the <coughs> browser field and then just like enter return and then close so for example if we run this as a Python script uh, What is going to happen is that now, wait, uh, oh, uh, so it's green, uh, a new kind of fiber instance that are like this, this little robot here is retrieving this website and then it went so fast we didn't even see any so just let's edit that so we can uh, see this more time uh, let's uh, uh, I don't know if I see around just 50 seconds here uh, getting that website typing or class website there it was so fast we kind of didn't see like it's typing all of that we're waiting for 15 seconds because I was told to do so and then it will be kind of entering our return key kind of triggers the web machine and now the web machine is saving the page and it will wait for like until like 20 more seconds uh, where we can see that the thing has like properly worked and now if you want to do this for a hundred websites
sides, we can just kind of wrap this entire thing in a for loop and like let it run. Like it will be making all these requests for us. And again, you find yourself having kind of to automate this uh, anything like uh, <coughs> web browser automation. Like I think the Selenium is like the most uh, developed project right now. But I think like John, you have really run in, in Rust. And um, they kind of have like pretty much all the same API, like searching elements, uh, entering some values, or like clicking through things. Um, yeah, that's pretty much all I wanted to cover for like the web browsers. Are there any questions? Thanks. So let's take a like 10 minute break and then we'll do all the security that's gonna make you paranoid. <laughs> and in the meantime, I can show you some really cool browser automation.